All right, as uh, folks are still trickling into the Zoom room, um, I'd like to wish you all a good afternoon and welcome you to this session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we will speak with author Timothy Schenk about his new book, Partisan Hacks, Political Visionaries and the Struggle to Rule American Democracy. And we're being joined by professors Michael Lind and Elizabeth Tandy Shermer. A warm welcome to all of you to the Washington History Seminar. I'm Christian Osterman. I direct the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program. And I have the pleasure to co-chair this seminar series with Eric Arneson of the AHA and George Washington University. Today, Eric will introduce our speakers and moderate the discussion. The seminar, as uh, the regulars uh, in our audience know, is a collaborative effort of our two organizations, the American Historical Association and the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program. For well more than a decade, the seminar has served as a nonpartisan forum to discuss important new historical findings, insights, and publications, something that's central to the mission of both of our organizations. Behind the scenes, there are two individuals to help produce this event, Rachel Wheatley for the AHA and Peter Bierstecker for the Wilson Center. Our thanks to both of them. We'd like to acknowledge our supporters and we welcome your support. Details about how to support the seminar uh, series um, uh, are available in the chat function right now or simply go to our institutional websites. We welcome your support. Finally, let me um, invite you to not just one, but two seminars next week. On November 7th, we'll be talking about, by hands now known, Jim Crow's legal, Jim Crow's legal executioners by Margaret Burnham. And on November on Thursday, November 10, we will uh, discuss Republics of Myth, um, National Narratives, and the US Iran conflict. Uh, just a quick technical note, our um, session today will be recorded and will soon appear on our websites. For the Q&A part, our audience has two ways to intervene in the discussion. Our preferred way is for you to use the raise hand function and the Zoom functionality and um, get yourself queued um, uh, uh, in line for um, a question or a comment to our panelists. Uh, when the moderator, in this case Eric, calls on you, you will receive a prompt. Please unmute yourself. Otherwise, we won't be able to uh, hear you. And you can start getting in line pretty much right away. Uh, you can also use the Q&A function uh, in the Zoom functionality, and then Eric will post your comments and questions to our panelists. And with that, it's over to Eric. Eric, Zoom room is all yours. Thank you, Christian. Welcome everyone, and it is my pleasure this afternoon to introduce our author. Timothy Schenk is an assistant professor of history and my colleague at the George Washington University. The co-editor of Dissent Magazine, he has written for numerous publications, The New York Times, The Guardian, The London Review of Books, The Nation, The New Republic, and Jacobin, just to mention some. His first book, a biography of the Cambridge economist and communist Maurice Dobb, was published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2013. He's been a Mellon postdoctoral fellow at Washington University in St. Louis and has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Council of Learned Societies, and the New America Foundation. He lives outside of Washington, D.C., and today he will be speaking on his new book, Realigners, Partisan Hacks, Political Visionaries, and the Struggle to Rule American Democracy, published by Farrah Strauss just about two weeks ago. Tim, welcome to the Washington History Seminar. Glad to have you. And thank you for having me, Eric. Thanks to everyone at the seminar for all the work that went into this. And I'm gonna thank uh, my discussants again later, but to get that um, up front now, thank you so much for the time you've already put into this. And let me just say, it's an honor to be here. All right. so. So I would start today with something that an old professor of mine used to say, which was that uh, his best books, he thought, started when he was angry, uh, usually because he had heard an argument from someone else that he just really didn't like. And 
in the way of professors, instead of going up to that person and saying you didn't like the argument, instead you retreat to your library for a few years, come out after five or so years with the book, and then hopefully win somehow uh, after the fact. It's a pretty nasty case of staircase wit, but it's one that I think we can all, uh, we're all pretty familiar with. Now, what I want you to do today was talk briefly about the specific kind of anger that I had when I started this book. So sort of the goals I had at the beginning, then how explain how over time that kind of generalized anger narrowed down into a pretty more targeted frustration with some pretty significant trends in modern intellectual and academic life. And then I want to close at the end by just reflecting on the significance of what the sort of, I feel like the journey I've gone through, sort of the arguments I make in the book, what significance they have for how we might think about American history, especially American political history more generally. Okay, so part one, what was I trying to do with the book? Well, maybe I can start in good historical fashion with the beginning of the idea for the book, which really occurred to me on the morning after the election in 2016. Now, I think many books were born on that morning and I had nothing like the particular image of the book in mind, as rather the particular version that emerged when I woke up, I'm ashamed to admit, more than a little hungover on November, whatever, 2016. But the impulse I had at the start was a sense that because of Trump's victory, we now knew that the boundaries of the American political tradition were wider than we'd imagined, that something had cracked open and that now maybe it wasn't a question of a sudden change in the American political tradition, but rather that an event that might have happened at an earlier time had just finally gotten its moment. And that we now knew that from some much earlier point down to now, the borders had just been a lot more porous than we thought. And so I want to write a book that reflected this possibility, the sense that the boundaries were wider. Maybe that meant they were just wider for the worse, but maybe it also meant that they were wider for the better. And I think that some of that spirit still animates the realigners as it emerged. But over time emerged, I came to think that the question that I'd come to at least was, it was a little poorly framed, that it wasn't a question of just that the Trump's victory proved, oh, nothing matters. There were just these infinitely wide boundaries. Anyone can say anything, doesn't count. But rather that I and lots of other people had been thinking about politics in the wrong way. And that instead of being this total aberration that came out of the blue, that Trump's victory was explicable under a different set of standards. Now, the book actually is not about Trump and any particulars, doesn't mention him that much, a lot of other figures uh, in the mix. But I think that overall orientation mattered because by the time I got to the end of the book, that sort of generalized frustration with the American political climate. I was frustrated with Trump. I was frustrated with people who voted for Trump. I was frustrated with elites who I thought enabled Trump from the Hillary Clinton campaign on down. So that generalized discontent had narrowed to two particular targets, uh, or at least two fields, two trends in my own world that I think are admirable in some respects, but also misguided in others. Um, one of those is the crisis of what you can think of as the crisis of democracy industrial complex. So this is, this is something I think that we're all familiar with here, this idea that from best-selling books to endowed professorships, a whole industry has emerged explaining this crisis of democracy that supposedly takes into account of a center that is under threat by populisms, mostly of the right, sometimes of the left. And whether this is Ziblatt and Levitsky's uh, best-selling work, How Democracies Die, it's seemingly an unending series of institutions and other para-academic enterprises, this has become a major force in the intellectual landscape over the last few years. All right, so that's one group that really emerged over the course of me writing the book, and that for reasons I'll explain in a little bit, I came to be frustrated with. The other has a bit longer genealogy. Um, so I think it was maybe 2015 that Jim Oakes talked about the emergence of what he called a new consensus history in the profession. Um, at the time, he defined this new consensus history as a sort of or scholarly orientation that emphasized a kind of white male capitalist supremacy as an almost all-encompassing master narrative for US history. And in Oakes's account, this turn to a new consensus history as the previous version, the sort of Richard Hofstad or Louis Hart style consensus account, he said that the new consensus had also drained conflict out of history so that we got stories about continuity that at all were often monocausal or at best a handful of causal um, emphasis in its particulars, and that drained its subjects of contingency, of complexity, of what historians so often describe as the master virtues of their discipline. Now, as I'll explain in a little bit, 
I don't think that the term new consensus is quite right for this approach. And I think that you'd also could fairly quibble with some of the more polemical edges to Oakes's argument. But I do think he at least has a point about a shift of emphasis within the historical discipline, a shift that has brought some gains with it, but that I think over time has run into some diminishing returns for reasons I'll talk about quickly. But for now, I also just want to acknowledge up front, both of these tendencies, sort of the crisis of democracy industrial complex and the new consensus history they occupy this kind of borderland space. Um, sometimes you find the, the views espoused in them within peer review journals. Sometimes you might find them in Twitter rants. Mostly they're in the sort of boundary between the two. Uh, a book like Ziblad and Levitsky's How Democracies Die or an initiative like the 1619 Project. They're not quite the American Historical Review or the American Political Science Review, but they do raise questions that I think that more strictly academic enterprises should reflect on because they are telling compelling stories about American politics today and American history over the long run. And if we don't have compelling responses to it, then it'll just be assumed that they speak for us, that this is the view that we are happy with, even if it's popularized, a little rough around the edges, that the broad strokes are correct. And if we don't think that story is right, then I think it's incumbent on us to explain why. All right, so how is this relevant for my book? Well, if you're thinking about American political history over the long run, each of these approaches, I think it suggests a focus. The crisis of democracy school would say like, let's concentrate on norms and institutions, or at least that's the centrist version of the crisis of democracy line. You might also have a more left account that would say, no, no, instead of just focusing on norms and institutions, we need to think about big structural reforms, how they've emerged in the past, how they might be changed today, those types of questions. The new consensus history, on the other hand, I think would have you looking for continuity over the long run. It would probably be downplaying change and be emphasizing the limits of maneuver within a system that again is dominated by a type of white male capitalist supremacy. Now, neither of these I thought ultimately worked for the story I wanted to tell. One, that crisis of democracy school because frustratingly for me, it had almost nothing to say about how majorities are actually formed. And this new consensus school, because I thought it undersold, especially in the 20th century, but not just for that period, I thought it undersold how much coalitions change. And not just over the long run, but between election cycles as well. And I came to see that approach as our sort of new consensus moment as an updated version of a periodic trend that you see when historians try to tell stories about American democracy over the long run that I call a kind of skeleton key approach to history, where you're looking for the one variable that explained how things work over the long run. Now, 100 years ago, as you all know, that variable if in an academic circles, it would be progressive historians telling a story about a battle between the many and the few, between essentially democracy and aristocracy. A little bit later, the first consensus school would say, no, 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 the master key, the skeleton key is about a liberal consensus. And now today we have this alternative view. But Ultimately, when it came down to thinking about elections, I felt that none of the, while each of those were important factors, that none of them had the analytic heft that I wanted. And so instead of focusing on a sort of single all encompassing answer, I tried to shift the focus to a question, that question of how majorities are formed, question that I felt that the crisis of democracy literature had understated and that the consensus approach didn't let me grapple with in its full particulars. I should note here too, so I've been putting together these two, this crisis of democracy and the new consensus school. But there's a pretty obvious tension between them, um, especially in its centrist variants. The crisis of democracy approach has a tendency to a kind of fetishization of norms. It says that these institutions, they're hollow. They've been passed down to us by our founders. They've been built up over the ages. It's our obligation to protect them today. The threat of January 6 is looming very much in this discussion today. On the other hand, a sort of new consensus approach would probably say norms, like what are these norms exactly you're talking about? Norms that are soaked in racism and patriarchy and centuries of oppression, that's what we're supposed to be defending right now. So you might think that it's odd that these two would be sort of jumped, lumped together, at least in my argument today. But I think they're united often in practice despite this theoretical inconsistency. I think one reason why is because they fit a particular partisan mindset. Now, let me explain why. All right. And this gets to why I also have some of my problems with the new consensus approach and why I think that, or rather the new consensus terminology. Because I think that neo-progressive is actually, or new progressive is actually a better term for the orientation that we see in a lot of recent academic work. Because the story of consensus, well, I mean, it's there, 
But to me, if you read books and just to put some names on the table, I think that this is an approach, this neo consensus approach, or rather neo progressive approach. I think it comes in both liberal, liberal and radical variations. So a liberal version of the story you might find from Heather Cox Richardson and how the South won the Civil War or John Meacham in The Soul of America. A more radical version you would find in Ibram X. Kendi's Stamp from the Beginning or Walter Johnson's Broken Heart of America. But in what these books, what they, the story that you tell you that they tell, although often very sophisticated, compelling in particulars, the big takeaway basically is a kind of neo-progressive story about good guys versus bad guys. It's not the good guys of old because the good guys of old are held up as examples of a kind of unthinking focus on class that dismisses race, gender, and the many other concerns that a full vision of social justice would bring to bear. But I do think it's a story essentially about a battle between the advocates of multiracial democracy and everyone else. And that that story is not too far off from a prehistory of red America versus blue America, or at least sort of the best version of blue America that these scholars would want to associate themselves with. So despite all the advances in subtlety and all the ways and all the advances that have been made over the last hundred years or so, I think that both of them end up reflecting a similar, almost moralistic interpretation to American political history. One that's deeply, one that's deeply reflective of our own partisan divides at the moment. Again, the story about essentially the prehistory of blue America versus red America. Now, as I explore in the books, I happen to think that this is terrible politics for the type of person with the admittedly left-wing politics that I have. I also think that this partisanation, this polarization, enlisting of history in the polarization wars, I think it's at best a risky move for academics at a time when our institutional legitimacy is under threat. But in the book and here today, I'm more concerned with the scholarly consequences. Because what I found when I was working on realigners is that whenever I had this framework in mind, this sort of proto blue America versus red America, that it just became really hard to make sense of the history I was trying to tell. From the drafting of the constitution, down to reconstruction and the new deal right up to the present. Now that's a lot to put on the table and a lot of specific interventions I'd be happy to make later. For now though, I just wanna thank you all for listening. Thank you all for coming and say that I'm gonna hold my tongue for the moment so that all of us can hear more from our discussants. Thank you, Tim. Our first discussant this afternoon is Michael Lind, who is a fellow at New America and a columnist at Tablet. A former editor or staff writer for Harper's, The New Republic, The National Interest, and Salon, he has taught at Harvard, Johns Hopkins, and the University of Texas, and has worked in the U.S. State Department and the Texas Legislature. He is the author of more than a dozen books of history, political analysis, fiction, and poetry, including The Next American Nation, published in 1995, Land of Promise, 2012, and The New Class War in 2020. Michael, welcome to the seminar. We're glad you're here. Well, thanks. It's, it's a great honor uh, to be here. It was a great pleasure to read the real liners. Uh, for years, I've been recommending the biographical and historical essays of Walter Badgett, the 19th century uh, British journalist, which, which I just, I think they're exactly the right link. You know, and I would uh, tell people, really nobody in human history needs more than a couple of dozen pages at, at most, you know, and, and I've developed uh, a real allergy to massive 800 page biographies. Partly it's because of my advancing age, I'm running out of time to read these massive biographies, but, but also I think if you're reading about uh, someone, uh, you, you want to read about the reason they're significant and remembered, right? Not, you know, uh, all, all of the minor details. Uh, for example, I remember a Locke biography. It turns out that uh, one of his jobs, uh, while he was a, a uh, enjoying the patronage of an aristocratic patron, was to uh, take the aristocrat's daughters shopping in London as a chaperone. All right. So this is what. Okay, but there's only so much, you know, shopping bills in, in London that you can put up with. Uh, and and I think one reason that uh, these kinds of brief biographies, and, and I see this wonderful book as, as kind of a, a badget type anthology of, it's, a, of, it's sort of a group portrait, uh, is the loss of belief in uh, agency, which arises from certain uh, worldviews uh, on, on the left in particular. And it's not just 
you know, say Marxist determinism, uh, 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 Thomas Hart Benton, the great uh, 1930s regionalist painter, you may have seen some of his New Deal era murals, uh, was the uh, grandson or great grandson, I don't remember, of the Jacksonian Democrat, Thomas Hart Benton, major political figure in American life in the 1830s and 40s. Uh, and the younger Benton, as an artist, refused to include any historical figures in his uh, murals. Uh, it was just ordinary people. Uh, and so there is a kind of a populist vision of history as a Thomas Hart Benton mural, uh, just of, of the sequence of events with the Native Americans and, and uh, the hunters and fishers and settlers and African Americans and immigrants and preachers and so on. And really the, the, the sort of major figures that you learn about in history classes uh, are kind of flotsam on, on this wave of humanity. And, and I think that's wrong. And, and uh, uh, clearly uh, uh, Timothy thinks it's wrong as well. Uh, and because if history is contingent, then who is in power at a certain time? Uh, who is out of power, but figures out a way to get in power? Uh, the people who can put together uh, coalitions of the kinds he describes, uh, they, they can literally change history. And this is not the great man or great woman theory of history. Uh, it's not that they're superhuman. It's just that history is underdetermined. Uh, and to the extent, and I may have been guilty of this to some extent, my most recent book, uh, uh, Land of Promise, an economic history of the United States, I emphasized successive waves of technological change uh, from the steam era to the uh, second industrial revolution and the third industrial revolution. But I've always tried to make it clear, I see technology and demographic factors and so on as constraints on what policy entrepreneurs, if you want to use that Washington term, can achieve. But you can come up with radically different structures with the same set of Lego blocks. So in the 1930s, uh, there was going to be some kind of accommodation of urban labor in all industrializing and industrialized countries in, in that period of history. But uh, uh, and, and some use by politicians of radio as a communications network. Uh, but Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, Adolf Hitler, and Juan Perón put these basic tools together. Uh, in, in quite different ways, which were not necessarily determined uh, by the tools themselves uh, or even by uh, some kind of internal dynamic of their own societies. Uh, so, so I think that's a, a, a great insight. And uh, what professor, perhaps in the, in the comments uh, period, in the question and answer period, Professor Schink can come up with a new name for his ism. Uh, because I, 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 the point is well taken. Uh, and I'm not being an uh, academic historian. I, I've often thought that there seems to be, and, and correct me if I'm mistaken, uh, those of you who are, uh, a kind of prejudice against counterfactuals uh, among academic historians. So, so you, have, you have us journalists and outsiders uh, you know, like Winston Churchill writing his story about what if the South had won the Civil War, and there's this, you know, whole uh, genre of counterfactual science fiction. And I get the impression this is sort of frowned upon, uh, but but I think it, it really is a very useful sort of heuristic exercise, right? So what if, just to point to recent contingency, 9-11 uh, had not happened? What if the FBI had rolled up the plot and then, you know, nobody heard about it? And, uh, uh, it, it wasn't very well publicized, and uh, we probably wouldn't have invaded Iraq. Maybe we would have. Uh, you know, there wouldn't have been this chain reaction of regime change uh, efforts by the U.S. and crumbling regimes throughout the Middle East. There wouldn't have been a backlash against foreign wars that brought Obama and Trump in different ways uh, to power. Uh, so, so what would the world be like? You know, what if 
What if there had been no compromise in 1820 and there had been a civil war when uh, the South was relatively much more powerful compared to the North uh, than it was in 1860-61? So, uh, so this is, a, I don't know what to call it, from the, if you want to use the first syllable, I would call it the contingency school. Uh, so from consensus to contingency. Uh, and, and I think that's the way to go. Thank you. Tim, any response before we move on? Well, okay, I'll dive in because I can't not. And I just wanna say that your comment, what it brings to mind is uh, observation that Adam Tooze makes in his book, Crashed, um, which I think is very well taken, where he says that you would think the paradox of our moment, and so as a historian, we have to say that this isn't, these tendencies aren't built into human nature, they emerge and evolve over time, but that the paradox, especially of more recent history, let's say 20th century to present, is that you witness the emergence of these gigantic structures that so clearly limit the bounds of individual agency within much, within much of our lives, but that paradoxically, the strength of those structures actually makes the decisions that are made at the top of them even more consequential, yeah. not just for hundreds, not just for thousands, not just for millions, literally billions of people. Um, Twos in his book is concerned with the decisions made at the top of the major institutions during the financial crisis of 2008. But you could extend this principle, principle more broadly. And I think that point is very well taken because it also cuts against a kind of vogue for structuralism, which I think you see also in a lot of political science when they take into account the coalition dynamics that are so important in my book, where there's a tendency to argue that, oh, once a few basic factors are sent to motion, then the story is set. And the effect of it is to downplay the choices that among others, campaigns, politicians, both activists, any of them make. And to some extent that advice is very good to keep in mind. Um, because it cuts against a tendency, especially among journalists who write about campaigns and some more archivally oriented political historians to treat a handful of decisions that are made, you know, the single campaign ad that determined the outcome of a race or the one debate flub upon which everything turned. And I think it also helps to keep in mind that if you're looking, for instance, uh, to take a couple, to take two changes that are at the heart of the more recent parts of my book, the migration of working class voters away from the Democratic Party and into the Republican Party over the last few years, especially and in the early going, especially white working class voters, but increasingly more a more diverse mix as time goes by, especially in more recent years. Um, it helps to point out that this is not a uniquely American phenomenon, that across much of the world, parties of the center left have and left and center left have been going through their own version of that transformation. Now, one consequence would be to say, oh, if this phenomenon is global, then there's nothing anyone can do about it. Let's just throw up our hands and accept it as a done deal. I happen to think that the story I tell um, in the book shows that from campaign to campaign, there's a lot more room for, yes, contingency than that narrative allows. But I think that with these questions in mind, we can at least start posing the right questions, even if we don't have, even if there's still going to be more than reasonable room for disagreement about the correct answers. Thank you. Our second discussant today is Elizabeth Tandy Shermer, who's an associate professor of history at Loyola University in Chicago, where she teaches courses on labor, capitalism, and politics. She's written about those topics in op-eds, academic articles, and scholarly books, including Sunbelt Capitalism, published in 2013, edited collections such as Barry Goldwater and the Transformation of American po Politics, 2013, The Right and Labor, a 2012 volume done with Nelson Lichtenstein, and Harvard University Press published her history of student loans, indentured servants, under its Belknap Press imprint in 2021. And she was a uh, featured speaker uh, on a session of the Washington History Seminar last year. She's currently finishing a new book on the public-private character of American higher education, tentatively titled The Business of Education. Ellie, welcome back to the seminar. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. Um, I want to thank everyone who makes this seminar possible first, not just Eric and Christian, but also Rachel, Rachel Wheatley is behind the scenes, does so much to make these seminars happy. And I'm always honored to have been asked back. Also grateful for the chance to get an early look at Shanks Realiners, which takes on the very formidable task of looking at these countries' small d, small d democratic elite, who walked that fine line 
or what Albemarle Freeman called the golden line between the rulers and the ruled. And that's actually how Shank opens this book. The ones who had to build, tain, build and maintain national electoral majorities from the founding to the present day when Shank rightly surmises many to cry both political stagnation and a total meltdown, as he said in his comments today. But Shank spares readers charts and statistics and focuses on individuals, sometimes a pair of realigners, whom he admits were largely elite white men, which really reflects the persistence of racial, gender, and economic inequality that some of them railed against and others, of course, aided. But what's particularly powerful about seeing a kind of continuity, even though Shank suggests he's not that fan of seeing that in some places, um, is the importance of such power brokers. Shank emphasizes that they accept, even celebrate conflict, not consensus, which remains a powerful term in 20th century political history, as he's talked about, despite all the work done on the divisions within and between what we now call the far right, conservatives, liberals, and leftists, no matter what party they vote for or were a member of. But what's also provocative, these realigners styled themselves as prophets of dooms or party hacks, which is an important reminder that this fear about the state and health of US democracy has been a part of past. The major parties have been important institutions in how US democracy functioned, and that the kind of populist appeal that David and Goliath character that Michael Kazin emphasized 20 years ago um, exists alongside other aspects of U.S. politics, including that paranoid streak that Schlesinger, Schlesinger Jr. stressed decades ago. But who were these realigners? Those in the first half, before the short interlude about the power of the Democratic Party from the New Deal to the Great Society, they're politicians who have great ideas about what U.S. democracy, capital D, should be or how to do the actual work of winning elections implicitly to rule um, and these chapters include a look at Alexander Hamilton and James Madison, who together wrote the Federalist Papers that emphasized the importance of federal power over unruly state legislators, legislatures, excuse me, the need for a virtuous political elite, and the importance of a national electoral mandate. These collaborators, of course, came to disagree. But in the end, even the triumphant Democratic Republicans included, they ruled with the tariffs and the national bank that Hamilton had championed. And yet Martin Van Buren would emphasize the need to limit the power of the central government when he reimagined the Democratic Party as the democracy, capital D, which did not include the wealthy elite, the radical abolitionists, the uncompromising members of the slaveocracy, the indigenous and early suffragists. These are the men and women threatening not just democracy, but the union itself, capital U. And of course, there would be a civil war when Republican Charles Sumner, the next um, person um, focused on, considered himself the representative of African-Americans on either side of the Mason-Dixon line. But Schenck emphasizes limits to this most famous of the radical Republicans, especially in regards to indigenous and women's rights. But Schenck interestingly considers Sumner's as one of those realigners that work within the system, an important theme in this book. An interesting read on a man who, with other Republicans, were able to rule, not just win elections, after pursuing Andrew Johnson's impeachment. There was also a military occupation of the Southern states that would only be redeemed after Confederates were stripped of their voting rights. States passed new constitutions, and ratified the Reconstruction Amendments that many consider fundamentally transforming the Constitution. But the real transformation of the relatively young Republican Party, and I think it's really important to think how young they were in this chapter, rested with the formidable father-daughter duo, Mark Hanna and Ruth Hanna McCormick, who managed to bring together an impressive Gilded Age, Progressive Era, and Roaring Twenties coalition. And I loved thinking about that arc of those decades of workers, businesses, newly enfranchised women, of course, white women more, were more likely to be able to exercise that right into a party unpolitic of business. And here's where Shank really gets bold, claiming the Democratic Party of Franklin Roosevelt was more a mirror image of Mark Hanna's GOP than a repudi repudiation, a party committed to good jobs and decent wages that worked through political machines and maneuvered carefully around the culture wars of its time, end quote. So not quite as far as those historians who claim the New Deal fundamentally came down to saving capitalism. But Schenck's idea of a mirror image is important for the larger argument of the interlude, that the Roosevelt coalition was a, quote, crazy quilt that no one could predict because it included Americans from vastly different areas, including the rural South, the arid and coastal West, the urban steel belt, and even the plain states. 
I'm going to come back to that short interlude in the middle of the book, spanning the 30s through the 60s, because Schenck boldly drops us back to the early 20th century with two realigners who are not politicians, but prognosticators of our current fractured age, or seemingly so, W.E.B. Du Bois, that towering African American intellectual who was over his lifetime a socialist, a liberal, professor, writer, journalist, NAACP activist, and separatist who died in Ghana, far from the New England town he was raised in. And Du Bois, if not for his race, could have been as towering a figure and political insider as Walter Lippmann, who once flirted with progressivism, was scarred by McCarthyism, and slow to understand um, the importance of both the Vietnam War and the civil rights insurgencies. But Schenck followed those chapters with a very incisive look at Phyllis Schlafly, who may have lost her races for elected office, but had a tremendous national following and ended up being the kind of political kingmaker, including for former President Trump. That's where he comes in. And that is important because she actually attacked kingmakers in her most famous book, the 1964 Choice Not an Echo. And I can't resist adding that it was terrific to highlight a post-war conservative who was not, who, excuse me, who was a Midwesterner, not a Southern Democrat or Western Republican. Those Sunbelt conservatives, too much has already been written about them, I think. What was particularly powerful about these three chapters together, they highlighted how much power existed outside the parties during their 20th century realignment, the background of the final half of the book, and emphasizing these realigners' power outside and beyond, beyond the parties, could have spoken to Shank's opening promise, or at least that's what I read it, to highlight the structural challenges to building a national electoral majority in the 20th century. And again, perhaps I read too much from your comments today, but one that would actually be able to rule. It used to be said that 19th century America was governed by courts and parties, animating a lot of scholarship to understand the power and rise of the federal government and the administrative state. But of course, another set of scholars, most notably Bill Novak, has stressed the power of states. And embedded in a lot of that work on policy history has been how how much power states retained to set regressive tax, union, electoral representation, and voting policies even before Nixon's new federalism tried to devolve that power back onto the states. So what's particularly provocative of looking at Du Bois, Lippmann, and Schlafly in that second half of the book is they highlight the power outside the parties before the 1970s, when both voter participation and party affiliation began to decline. And honestly, it's plummet, let's just be honest. So suddenly picking up on an important change of who could and did straddle that golden line between the rulers and the ruled, even if they didn't have the power to govern. And that's helpful because the majority of Americans are now unaffiliated with either party. Turnout did increase in 2020, but voter participation, particularly in midterm and off-cycle elections, let's see what happens next Tuesday, let alone the primaries, it's been awful for decades. And there's only recently been public recognition that US elections are like an etch-a-sketch. Campaigns need to erase a lot of the promises that made they have to make during the primaries, primaries excuse me, to reveal in the general. But I think that raises more questions for not just Shank, but all of us to consider today. What do the lives of Du Bois, Lippmann, and Schlafly reveal about the changing structure of US politics that made it possible for thinkers and pundits to be able to reach and persuade Americans than their elected representatives who actually had the task of governing? Or perhaps fed not just the dismay and sense of doom, but also eligible voters' indifference, because indifference is also important. And I hope these questions push us all to consider a larger one. What are the structural issues, and maybe I'm too, being too much of an unapologetic, unapologetic structuralist, that scholars, journalists, and citizens themselves need to consider why even electoral majority was not enough to guarantee a governing majority? And did that disconnect feed voter apathy and disenfranchisement? And I ask that because this book started with that golden line between the rulers and the ruled, but the focus really seemed to shift and focus on that winning that electoral majority, even though the difference between winning elected office and actually being able to govern seems to have widened across the 20th century and certainly into the 21st. 
So what can Shanks biographical chapters, and I want to agree with um, my colleague Michael Lind, gosh, they're wonderfully rich to read. What can they tell us about why realigning the electorate didn't guarantee those elected to rule could actually rule? As Shanks says in the introduction, the issue is structural, but these structures didn't descend from above. The American political system was created by a governing class whose power derived from its ability to speak for we the people, end quote. And so what are those structures? and which governing class should we look to to understand them? Should we look back to the framers? Conception of the country as the United States, where even after Reconstruction, citizens register to vote in their states, which can, as Van Buren did, and legislatures still do, place real limits on voting for citizens of color. And the persistence of US federalism and the power it still gives to individual states and even local governments relates to a general sense that even in the 21st century, this country doesn't have one Democratic Party or one Republican Party. Really, they vary so much state to state. How California's Governor Gavin Newsom and Illinois' J.B. Pritzker campaigns are vastly different, just as New York's Nelson Rockefeller ran for re-election in a far different way than California's Ronald Reagan ran for his first election again in roughly the same time. And going back to that interlude and in FDR's election, how surprising was that victory really, which was before the modern primary system, as Margaret O'Mara reminded us in Pivotal Tuesdays. There were multiple votes at the Democratic National Convention in 32 before FDR emerged as a nominee, and that reflected how divided state parties were across the country, which is easier to see by looking at local and state elections. Or maybe the structure we should look back to now is the founders' preference for a divided government with checks and balances on federal power, the people's power, of course, most clearly in electoral college and initially leaving state legislators to pick the Senate or the many checks on the president's power. I'm gonna mention that last one because this book ends with Obama, blending politics with community organizing. And I think Shank offers a wonderfully helpful read on his early life, as well as the three phases of his presidency that seems to end with Obama's legacy being not how he or being how he transformed and divided the Democratic Party. But another way to read the rich narrative that Shank gives us in the chapters leading up to this one and the one on Obama is how hard it can be after legislative malapportionment across the country before the 1960s gave way to gerrymandering. And gerrymandering eventually meant, especially as voter turnout declined, that an electoral majority for president, even one with a slim supermajority in Congress like Obama had, wasn't enough to be able to govern. Something hidden by the attention on what FDR and LBJ were able to do. But far too many journalists and scholars ignore those legislative successes hinged on massive majorities in Congress during specific moments in that 30 year interlude. The reputations of those mythical presidents seem to have hung over the choices Obama made. Obama followed his mother's advice to push for change within the system and kept his eyes focused on the presidency. When in retrospect, he could arguably have wielded more power by sticking it out in the Senate to someday become a majority leader, which both Lyndon Johnson and Mitch McConnell realized may not be able to realign the parties, but did wield a lot of power, as Thaddeus Stevens and other radical Republicans did after the Civil War. Or what if Obama had followed the clear path to the Supreme Court that he had as the editor of the Harvard Law Review? After all, those nine jurists also wield tremendous power over the American democratic experiment. Or what if Obama much earlier had parlayed his oratory skills in a media landscape where MSNBC and Fox News have a loyal viewership that might be able to actually get their viewers to vote or protest? And perhaps there's a hint in the conclusion about a real structural change that would make this country live up to a definition of democracy that has radically changed since the founders focused on the citizenship rights of property owners. Schenck ends not just with the January 6th insurrection, but a reminder of how organizers struggle to decide who should be included in the 63 March on Washington. Public memory, textbooks, and honest Honestly, U.S. history surveys have narrowed it to Martin Luther King's inspiring speech. But A. Philip Randolph, who first amended a march on Washington in World War II, was welcomed to the stage during the six-hour event, um, but not legal civil rights icon, Polly Murray. But something else for us all to remember. You know that march was on a work day? <laughs> 
So one could not just see the thousands who came to the mall, but also their absence on the job, a reflection of how more Americans than four, but certainly not all, had the rights on the job to actually participate in politics and civic life, not just rewatch a TV rate cap later or maybe see it on their smartphones. That was, of course, during that 30-year interlude when the Voting Rights Act was not only passed, but actually enforced. Working longer hours for less pay is, of course, just one roadblock to marshalling a winning majority, empowered to hold their elected leaders accountable, but is an important one for both Shank and all of us to consider as we ask, just days before the midterms, not just what it will take for another realignment, but to have a functioning, responsive democracy. Thank you. Ellie? Thank you very much. Tim, some issues. And I have to, I'll double that thank you and just add that it is astonishing and more than a little chastening to hear someone so deftly summarize a book I worked on for five years in about 15 minutes. Uh, it was a really, really wonderful experience. So thank you so much, Ellie. Um, and on that point, all right, a lot to chew on here. So I think I'll just, um, as I guess the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, I'll just take a little step right now to say this point about the transformation of the parties over the 20th century, and especially in the wake of the sorry, coinciding with the breakdown of the New, New Deal coalition and accelerating in recent decades. I don't know if I included this in the book and I wish I had, but one way I've on the book tour been describing the transformation is one essentially where you could say without doing a little bit of violence, but not too much, that you could tell the story of American politics in the 1950s as a battle between a Democratic Party defined by the AFL-CIO and a Republican Party defined by the Chamber of Commerce, um, and how that gives way over the last 70 years to a Democratic Party of MSNBC and a Republican Party of Fox News. And partly this is an ideological or cultural change. The substance of the argument does shift over time. But as you draw our attention to, it's also crucially an institutional one, where you're moving into that more mediatized um, sphere dominated by our cable news, which really stands in here for the larger political infotainment complex, which is a multi-million dollar, which is a multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar industry at this point, and which despite only drawing a couple million view, a few million viewers every night, wields just vastly disproportionate influence over how our political class thinks, um, including very significantly Donald Trump, of course, our most favorite cable, t our most famous uh, cable TV news addict. And it gets us to a world today where you, I think it is fair to say that your typical Republican Senator would much rather be Tucker Carlson than whoever he is. And your typical Democratic Senator would much rather be Rachel Maddow than whoever they are. And I think that does say something really powerful about the transformation in our political class over the last 50 years. And it gets to, when you think about specific arguments in the book, uh, for me, the moment that this really crystallized was looking at Phil Schlafly's life, where she runs for Congress first in 1952, then again in 1970. The first time at 52, she's a 20-something housewife who doesn't think that she has much of a much of a chance. She's running in a solidly Democratic district. It's more just a sacrifice for the Republican Party. But in 1970, she thinks she could win. Uh, she's built more of a reputation for herself. She's hopeful that in the age of Nixon, after when the crumbling of this New Deal coalition has really started to come into sight, she's hopeful that she could put together a winning election. Now, she doesn't. Uh, bad economy chiefly swamps her in that year. But I realized when I was working on the chapter that if Schlafly had won that election, then she almost certainly would never have been anything near like the force that she became over the 70s when she turned into the public face of the anti-ERA movement, right? As a backbencher, junior Republican, a minority party in the House, there's just little room that she would have had. So she would have been, and since by being rejected from mainstream politics, she was luckily for her forced into what at times seemed like a marginal position, but ended up presaging the turn of the sort of rise of this political infotainment complex. And to think about Schlafly in particular, it also just reminds me of why that chapter was so important for me, because it was when the book as a whole really clicked into place, which gets at this question of just, as my political scientist friends might ask me, what were sort of the causal criteria behind selecting my particular characters? And one moment for me in acknowledging, of course, that when you're talking about these dominant coalitions, which necessarily include millions of people, that means that there are, if not millions, then a really wide field of potential candidates. An important moment for me was realizing that, to my eyes at least, there's a lot more in common between Charles Sumner and Phil Schlafly 
than one might think just from standing outside and looking from afar, that within this somewhat arbitrary divide between the partisan hacks and the political visionaries, both of them saw, leaned more toward that visionary element, the visionary side of the spectrum. Now you can have very strong opinions about the direction that they want to push the country, but both of them saw themselves as ideological crusaders pushing for radical change through lower case democratic means at a time when a political establishment in both of their parties, which happened to be the Republican Party in both cases, would have been much more comfortable going along with the status quo. So thinking about those similarities over the long run ended up being important for me in thinking about political change more generally, which brings me to this question about majorities and what they can actually accomplish. And here, instead of I take Ellie's point about the limits of majority building today. And if I were reviewing the book and looking to jab at it, one thing you could do is take that even farther and say, oh yeah, Mr. Nostalgia's for the New Deal coalition. What about 1936, right? So not only is that a larger victory for FDR than 1932, not only is it one of the largest, just in absolute terms, victories in American presidential history, it's also the moment when that New Deal coalition that rooted in the working class, breaking Americans along class rather than culture lines, that really, really kicks into gear, arguably expressing itself more clearly in that election than at any other time in American history. And the book ends with a sort of look back at that moment and a suggestion that if we are to find a legitimately democratic, as in winning elections, um, an authentically democratic way out of our crisis of democracy today, then it could be through some form of reconstitution of that 1936 coalition. Now, the awkward fact for me is that after winning that triumphant victory, the democratic New Deal, New Deal agenda basically runs into a brick wall, that the major achievements, as Alan Brinkley argued long ago, the major achievements of the New Deal were already pretty much set in place by 1937. It's not to say that nothing is achieved on the domestic front afterwards, but compared to the victories of that earlier term, of the first term, the accomplishments of that second Roosevelt term seem positively slight, I think it's fair to say. Not non-existent, but not transformative on the same level as what came before. Which is just to say that even though I believe for lots of contingent reasons today that forming a new majority is, and exactly, the 19, it sets the stage for the 1938 midterm backlash, um, Ellie just noted in our chat, which begins um, after 1936, 1938, you see already forming in Congress the outlines of a conservative majority that will express itself more fully by 1968 and afterwards. So right at the peak of this moment, first you see that even with the numbers behind it, a majority by itself cannot deliver change, and that those victories, at least in this case, was so fleeting, so that already the outlines of defeat come to sight within just a single campaign, which, to my larger argument, goes to just how contingent all of this can be, or at the very least, how short-lived these alliances that we might be inclined to treat as permanent, so permanent that we turn American history into a longer story about red versus blue with more or less stable teams over the long run, you know, if it can't even last over four years, uh, point worth taking. But to turn it back to the critique of me, I would say that with the 1936 example in mind, it suggests that coalition victories is forming these majorities. They might be an essential piece of the puzzle, but they can never be the whole story, to which I would only respond, yes, but it's an important start. Right. With that, happy to turn it over to questions more broadly. Thanks so much, folks. We now go to the question and answer period. As Christian noted at the outset, there are several ways that you can participate. You can use the raise hand function. I will call on you, you will unmute, you get to pose the question yourself, or you can use the question and answer function on Zoom, in which case you type a question and I get to read it. So preferences for you to ask it yourself if you can, but happy to read your question if you want. With that said, we have several hands up. Nelson Lichtenstein is gonna lead us off from the West Coast. Nelson. Unmute, join the conversation. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Hi, Nelson. Great to hear you. Uh, you can't see me, though, but that's okay, I guess. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Okay. It's, it's voice only. A voice only? Okay. Hi there. Uh, so I, I haven't read your book, and um, uh, I just, uh, you sort of half answered this question uh, the last part of your your, your, your talking. Um so I spent my academic career in the in the rise and fall of the New Deal order kind of framework. Um, so tell me, what is what is your relationship to that uh, frame, at least for the uh, explaining uh, politics in the 20th century? I, I, I'm not I'm not um, I mean, you mentioned the 36 election. And, and yes, that was an important election, although the coalition you one would not want to recreate because it included the white 
segregation is south. But nevertheless, what is your relationship uh, of your book to the to that frame, the rise and fall of the New Deal order uh, frame? Yeah, that's uh, Jim, thank you so you much could, for asking that. You could define that on for us. Oh, sorry, sorry. What, Nelson? What, Eric? If you could define what Nelson just laid out for those who aren't academics or who haven't read um, the classic literature on this. All right. So, uh, and Nelson, you can correct me um, as one of the co-authors of the, or as one of the, or as you pointed out, main voices behind this. But I think a fair representation would be something like when you're looking at the long picture of modern American political history, especially 20th, political, 20th century political history, there's a moment roughly 1930s into the 1960s that you can think of as a coherent period dominated by this New Deal political order, this New Deal order rather, which is both economic, social, and political. So you have Democrats as the kind of de facto majority party, not always, but most of the time. You have a political system that's oriented broadly toward labor, toward the welfare state. This is the moment when those basic elements of what we think of as the welfare, American welfare state at the national level click into place, and that it stands in stark contrast to what Gary Gerstle, one of the other major figures um, behind this turn, has described as a neoliberal order that has emerged since the 1970s, where instead of looking to the state, looking to this alliance between labor and labor and the federal government for support, this is the period of the market, a period of deregulation, a, sh you know, roughly speaking, from a political coalition defined by Franklin Roosevelt to a world defined by Ronald Reagan. Now, there's a lot of subtlety and complexity along the way, but those are the high points. And I would say, actually, it's a fascinating to compare this with the sort of political institutional state centered historiography that Ellie was drawing upon in her comment, where just my own sense is that there's a very strong case for continuity. And this is another instance where electoral majorities, while significant, are not everything. And the sort of long hangover state development in the 20th century presents constraints on what both the left and the right are capable of doing. So when I think about the institutional story, of the 20th century and some of the key structural factors, like the influence of capital, for instance, I incline a bit more toward a emphasizing continuity over the 20th century across change. But on this coalition story, this sort of the aspect I'm concerned with in this book, just the politics of it, I think that the New Deal order story is fantastic and holds up really well, better than I think a lot of colleagues around my age are inclined to give credit to when they push for the continuity over the long 20th century argument that there really is a breakdown that especially, again, you can see this New Deal coalition emerging roughly 1930 to 1936 is this crucible period in which it takes shape. By 1938, you can already see how it come apart. It's that process accelerates in the 40s and 50s. It's fully clarified in the 60s. And then there's a working out period over the last 40 years. But to my mind, although as a historian of policy and institutions, I have my own inclination, my own bias toward continuity when telling the story. Politically, it makes a lot of sense. And that's something that at a time when I feel like there's a tendency to push continuity as our master narrative for the 20th century in politics institutions across the board, my own inclination is to emphasize that there really is a rupture that takes place and that the New Deal order story gets us a good deal of the way there to explaining what that was. I think the only thing that I would add as someone who's engaged in this stuff about the, the question about uh, reconsidering the New Deal order is I think one of the most important things to understand about it is how contested it was. And I actually mean that beyond the classic thing is of uh, that um, uh, domestic and um, agricultural laborers are left out of key parts of it because of that settlement part. But actually, since you hinted at your earlier comments about that sort of conservative coalition that's there are aspects of it that can coalesce after that 1938, but just, you know, the other things that we're now peeling back the layers and realizing is about the exclusion of public employees, which puts real limits on um, the power of a lot of the democratic machines, those who are actually unionizing them. But I think the key thing about it is to understand that I, the way that I think about the 1940s and 1950s is if you have states passing right to work laws, pro business taxes, basically undermining the New Deal at the local and the state level, it really just shows you how contested what was actually able to come out of the 30s actually was. And I think that that's a fun mental part of, of reimagining and understanding it and thinking about the longer origins of neoliberalism than the 70s that Gary Kirstel would have us believe. Thank you. Stephen Shore has been patiently waiting with a raised hand. Stephen, I think you know the routine. Yes. Um, You've unmuted. Welcome. We'll talk. Uh, you've talked about the, um, Mr. Stenis talked a lot about the 
1936 election, but I've no of no analysis of the three presidential landslides in our lifetime, or at least some of our lifetimes, 1964, 1972, and 1984. And I'm wondering what lessons he would draw from those three elections and also why there has not been a landslide of that magnitude since 1984. Great. So with 1964, the one, it's hard to come up with terribly novel things to say about one of the more significant elections of, if not quite my lifetime, than the recent, recent American history. But one point that was driven home to me, and this connects to the argument about the rise and fall of the New Deal order, is how much the FDR coalition had already crumbled by 64. And that when you look at the states where Johnson did best in 1964, many of them were states where FDR had done poorly in 1936. So that Vermont, for instance, Vermont and Maine famously, uh, two states that um, FDR doesn't carry in 1936, but that LBJ does in 64. And I think that this transformation has been obscured by the fact of just Johnson's victory. So there's a tendency to say, FDR won big in the 1930s, LBJ won big in the 1960s. Therefore, you can see uh, that Democrats were in fine shape, at least at those two points. But what you see when you look more closely is that areas where FDR had run strongest in that landslide were areas where LBJ, even if he ran, even if he won, didn't do especially well. And LBJ was already doing better in this sort of proto blue America coalition, more suburbanized, more affluent, more rooted in the Northeast than what FDR had done in the 1930s, which helps explain why 1968 doesn't come out of nowhere, why the shift from a 60 something percentage LBJ victory in 1964 gives way to Nixon and Wallace carrying a combined 57, 58% of the vote just four years later. But thinking about landslides and whether we can have one like that today, just the example of a country that could go from 60 something percent for LBJ in 64 to 60 something percent for Richard Nixon in, 19, in 1972, just eight years later, does suggest how much flexibility there was in the system at the time. And the fact that our biggest variation over the last 20 or so years. It's something like Obama, 53% in 2008, George W. Bush, uh, 51% or so in 2004. You know, that just the boundaries do seem to have narrowed. Of course, this isn't the only time in American history where parties have competed fiercely over narrow majorities that can't, are handed back and forth from election cycle to election cycle. The Gilded Age is an often, and I think correctly cited precursor in this respect. But the fact of that recent of that historical precedent suggests to me that while it's there's no way to know for sure why exactly elections have become so narrow, I do think that this is a case where I want to, and maybe this is just the political optimist in me bleeding over into the scholarly analyst. I want to say that it seems like there's at least room to argue that choices made have narrowed those margins by political elites have narrowed those margins more than they have to be. So, for example, uh, decisions that uh, Mitt Romney might have made to lean into almost the image, a, a caricature of Republicans as the vulture capitalists circling the American dream with a hungry glint in their eye, certainly didn't do Republicans any favors in 2012. I think that there are lots of choices that Hillary Clinton made in 2016 that you could argue narrowed her coalition more than it had to be. So I think that while that you, one could argue that Maybe the story about American history, instead of just being this constant sun and moon, there's always a majority, there's always a minority. Maybe our perspective is a bit biased by especially this 1890s to 1960s period, which is in a sense an age of those, sort of those really big majorities are delivered on a consistent basis. The story is just a flip from the Republican coalition that McKinley and the Hannas made to the Democratic coalition of FDR. And that's probably no coincidence. This emerges during a period where national machine politics are more triumphant, more powerful than they were before, where you have national institutions more generally commanding a greater say over our collective life, and that the breakdown of those institutions over the last 60 years has contributed to a narrowing of those majorities. That's possible. But on the other hand, so the basic imperatives of the system, the demand for, for majorities, substantial majorities, in order to get legislation through, combined with the particular character of a political elite that since the 1960s has been more, caricature, more characterized by the group that James Q. Wilson described as amateurs, 
So people, activists who are disproportionately college educated, care more about causes than they do about patronage, set themselves self-consciously against the partisan machines of yesteryear. The emergence of this amateur who grows into the activist, who becomes the sort of native denizen of that political infotainment complex we know about today. Well, the fact that the incentives for those amateurs tend to involve more around giving your audience what they want so that they will give you money, clicks, and support in return, as opposed to winning elections, to me suggests that there might at least be space for, if not a return to the sweeping majorities of the 30s or the 1890s, at least space for a political class that was more tightly concentrated on the need to win elections by the largest number possible than we have today. Thank you. I'm going to use co-chair prerogative to pose my, my own question here. And I want to ask you to talk about your prophets, um, the visionaries uh, in, in the book. Um, one thing that I don't think has come across as clearly as it might in our discussion is that this book is chock full of biographical stories. And, and Michael mentioned this, you know, at the outset. Uh, it's not an 800 pager, but it but but you have these amazing stories um, in which you both set, you know, personality and structure and the transformation of structures, you know, side by side. Um, so you you can learn a great deal about Martin Van Buren. Uh, for example, or Mark Hanna, uh, as well as you know some of the 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 bigger names, but visionaries. Um, for the 20th century, you look at uh, Du Bois, Lippmann, and Schlafly, and wondering about the choice of Du Bois. Uh, Schlafly has fingerprints on politics that are just so visible. Lippmann, at least, you know, is in the paper multiple times every week for decade after decade, you know, and he speaks for kind of a changing sense of, of establishment sensibilities. Du Bois is a figure whose fingerprints are on ideas, literary and political, but less on politics per se, and, and a little bit tentative and hesitant as I as I say this, because I don't want to, to misspeak, but I have no doubt he's a prophet and a visionary, and he is a rock star in the academy today. But by the time you get to the 1940s, he's not so much of a rock star in the realm of civil rights and Black politics. And in fact, he seems to be marching to the beat of his own drummer, which is very much at odds where the rest of the elements of the civil rights coalition is going. He rejoins the NAACP. He squabbles with Walter White, who arguably has fingerprints on, on politics proper. Um, and then he flirts with and kind of gets a whole new crowd to hang out with, with the communists, you know, who adopt him and whose praises he sings. So in a certain sense, you know, there's a, he's not in harmony um, with the broader political currents by the late 1940s and the 1950s. So could you just say a little bit about the choice of Du Bois? Can I add on to that? How, how he fits into to this picture. Can I add on really quick to that? Because my first thought actually, and it had nothing to do with who is our host, was like, I wondered actually if A. Philip Randolph, <laughs> especially if you want to do with the March on Washington at the end, um, we're all waiting this 800 page biography of A. Philip Randolph um, would be a realigner. And actually I would add just because again with the March on Washington, I thought about Walter Ruther and especially his ideas about <laughs> politics, another 800 page biography that is out there. But I just especially for all the reasons that um, Eric just raised about Du Bois. And I just wondered about that, those choices, or if there are other realigners that you might have added on to. Sorry. Oh, absolutely. Um, and a few different uh, points along the lines of those great questions. And uh, something that a character who I returned to a few times in the book, who one person I was um, having an interview with described as sort of the guardian angel of the book, which I liked, uh, Bayard Rustin, and just sort of like the through line that you can draw from Rustin to Randolph, that makes a lot of sense. And one definitely could have told the story through those figures. But why did I, why I chose them? Um, few reasons. And I say them because to me, Du Bois and Littman are inextricable. Um, I said I was never going to do one by themselves. I felt like I had to do them both together. 
And one reason is just that there was a basic problem that I was confronted with when I was trying to explain this New Deal majority, which is one could argue, and I essentially do in the book, the strongest and both the both the strongest and the strangest majority to emerge in American political history. So one that literally stretches a fact that just blew my mind uh, when I was researching the book, discovering that in 1936, FDR carries Harlem by 70 something percent at the same time that he wins South Carolina by literally 99 percent. Right. That sort of that dictatorial vote level is a suggestion, not just of FDR's popularity in the South, but of Jim Crow's strangulation of local politics. Right. That you don't get those Vladimir Putin style numbers without a Vladimir Putin style autocracy backing you up. So that suggests the tension that's going to be there in that relationship from the start. And as a consequence, when I was trying to when I was looking for figures who could act as my prophets, my seers, my visionaries, people who saw this New Deal order coming, this New Deal coalition coming, the difficulty I ran into was that as far as I could tell, no one did, or at least if they did, I couldn't find them. And I looked really hard and I asked a lot of people who specialize in the period. Okay. Okay. Who is the Kevin Phillips for the emerging democratic majority? The person who sees ahead of the curve and can say, this is what the new democratic coalition is going to look like. And they didn't come up with good answers for me because there are lots of folks who in the, at the start of the depression are saying that we need to have a new majority party. We need to blow past these constraints on our system. We need to force American politics to catch up with these massive transformations in American economics. They just didn't think that Democrats were going to be that party. The assumption was that it would have to be a third party that plowed over the bitter remains of the two party system, broke that dead hands grasp on our collective throat and liberated us, brought us into that almost sort of succeeded where the populace and the progressives and their different ways had failed. And the idea was that the depression was going to after the depression was going to crack open a system that until then had been impervious to that type of assault, except for the Republicans of the 1850s. And the failure of that third party vision to come to, come to pass, the question of why there was not a party that could essentially do for capitalism what Republicans had, for this sort of social democratic vision, what Republicans had done for abolitionism, that was a puzzle. And so it forced me to look outside the standard, okay, who's someone who sees the majority coming along ahead of time? But I wanted to treat that almost as a permission because when you are broken free from the obligation to represent someone who sees it coming, you can also think more seriously about how it comes apart. And one line that got stuck in my head earlier, maybe it's, I'm wrenching it now just because I was referring to Kevin Phillips, he talks in the emerging Republican majority about how he sees the conservative majority that's coming out of Nixon's victory, or at least is made possible, or whose extent is suggested by Nixon's victory, he sees it essentially as a coalition of the middle against the top and the bottom, a coalition that's made possible by the conversion of the Democratic Party, in, in uh, Phillips's words, into an alliance between Harvard and Harlem, or the New York Times and sort of the discontented masses of urban America, a concept that, of course, is clearly racialized in Phillips's vision. And this put in my head the question about if the alliance between this liberal elite and African-Americans is so central to the making of the Republican coalition in the 1960s, and Phillips is blunt on the subject at the opening of the Republican emerging Republican majority, he says that the chief catalyst, at least in the short term, for the emerging Republican majority is what he describes as the nationalization of, quote unquote, the Negro problem. So if this alliance between liberal elites and African-Americans is a crucial part of the story then I wanted a relationship because I also decided that the sort of failure to find a profit gave me license to cheat a little bit. So if I'm going to do two, then I wanted a relationship that could get at that dynamic. And there is, of course, a scholarship, a large body of scholarship out there on this. And you guys might have seen me looking around because here, a recent example, recent-ish example, and a good one from my bookshelf, uh, Racial Realignment, The Transformation of American Liberalism, 1932 to 1965, from the Berkeley political scientist Eric Schickler, arguing that essentially this coalition between liberals and African-Americans was already well underway in the 1930s, and that the Great Society is just a working out at the national level of an alliance that had already emerged at the grassroots like, considerably earlier. And I take that point about sort of the signs for movement building and connection that Schickler draws our attention to. But with Du Bois and Lippmann, one argument I wanted to make in response was that at least at this elite level, and the elite level matters, that the linkage between civil rights and American liberalism took a lot longer to cohere. And that looking at someone like Lippmann and Du Bois, and among other things, telling the story of their relationship, they're friend-ish 
for a long period of their lives. But Lippmann is nothing like a staunch defender of civil rights until he's basically forced to be in order to maintain good, his like good standing within the American establishment in the 1960s. He's writing caught in quasi sympathetic defense and yeah, basically sympathetic defense of Southern senators and the right of the filibuster well into, I think the 1950s. It's late in the day that he takes this push. And Du Bois's frustration, and in particular, the fact that Lippmann was at his happiest with American politics in the 1920s and 1950s, at exactly those moments when Du Bois was most frustrated, and that Du Bois was at his, and that Du Bois in turn was happiest with American politics, namely this heyday of the New Deal order, the 1930s, when Lippmann was most frustrated, suggested that despite some real affinities between them, the fact that they come out of, by the time they're at Harvard, they're working with similar professors, they have some broadly similar career arcs and that both have a foot in academia, a foot in journalism. They're seen as representatives of causes larger than themselves. Du Bois self-describes as a spokesman of his race. Walter Littman is cast as the face of American liberalism. That sort of repeated failure of connection points to just some basic facts um, and a more banal political level. For instance, Adelaide Stevenson, that Adelaide Stevenson's mixed at best, I would say that's generous, I would say like outright terrible record on civil rights did nothing to diminish liberal enthusiasm, enthusiasm among liberal activist elites for Stevenson in the 1950s and into the 1960s. Kennedy's own mixed record on this prior to a dramatic late in life conversion also suggests that this was among white liberals, racial justice is a late arrival at center stage. It's something that they can endorse, but don't make central to their enterprise, so central that they're willing to blow up the New Deal coalition over it. All of this suggested to me that by telling the story of Littman and Du Bois, I would get some some profound observers of American politics who were each telling the story of the making of this New Deal coalition, a coalition so strange that neither of them could quite, quite believe it was emerging as it was taking place, despite the fact that they were so insightful in other respects, but that found their views on politics transformed by it. And then this also allowed me to suggest how, if not contingent, then surprising at the time, the throwing together of American liberalism with the cause of civil rights would have seemed in the 1960s, so that you get this post hoc marriage of Littman and Du Bois, at least the worldviews that they represent, which then happens to be uh, nicely embodied by Barack Obama, where I pick up the story of American liberalism later. And so tell on an intellectual level a kind of, to the extent that one can, which is you know, never going to be perfect, but I think better than nothing, a sympathetic but a sympathetic intellectual biography of American liberalism during this period that shows how much it had to change to get to where it was in the 1960s. And that suggests the sort of lines of breakdown that were there all the way through. Um, that was the decision that went into picking those two. So I realized I've dodged the question about Du Bois, but only because I felt like it was with that combination of the two of them that I could get at both the electoral story and also this sort of deeper intellectual story that I think has real significance that I wouldn't have gotten even if I had a sort of more pure representative of the working class coalition that you could have imagined, like Randolph, like Ruther, like um, even the Kaiserlings who I draw out, um, Leon Kaiserling and Mary Dublin Kaiserling who I draw out in the chapter. Something about those two, sort of the fact of them being, having one foot within this New Deal order and one foot outside of it also allowed me to tell the story of its breakdown in a way that wouldn't have if I just had these figures were happy at this moment and felt blindsided by what came after. Thank you. We have an anonymous attendee who poses a question about, well, recent times. What do you think about the possibility that the left or elites grew very comfortable from 2008 to 2016 and were blind to the many that were not happy with the ascendance of progressivism and hence the 2016 surprise. American history seems to have many examples of shifting left, shifting right, and 2016 was mostly just that, with one difference, the massive networking of America and media and data analysis occurring through the Obama administration. Yeah, and so I very much take the point. I would shift the chronological focus a little bit though. So one of the arguments I make in the Obama chapter, which I don't think I've seen elsewhere, so I'm gonna say it's at least newish or was new to me, is that so far historical retrospectives on Obama the and, and his presidential legacy have tend to focus on the first term, which makes sense. So it's 2008, 2012, especially 2008, 2011, those are the major policy, the major legislative accomplishments. And there are arguments about, did he go too? Did he go too far? Did he not go far enough? Especially, did he not go um, far enough? How did this set the back the stage for the Tea Party backlash? But there's a sense that policy-wise, and therefore presidency-wise, 
the story is set by 2011 or so. And that if we're going to understand Obama's legacy, we have to focus on the accomplishments or lack thereof of that period. And I don't challenge the argument that the major policy decisions were made in that period, but I would suggest that the political legacy, actually the second term might be even more relevant, even more salient for at least the short and medium term evolution of the Democratic Party. By which I mean that Obama in 2012, when you look at the campaign that he ran, and this was very much a strategy on the part of his advisors, I quote David Axrod explaining what the thinking was in 2012, was saying like, listen, out of the vast panoply of objects that Democrats could campaign on in 2012, we realized that in the face of stiff economic headwinds, the only way that Obama had a chance of winning re-election was to cast himself as the champion of a beleaguered middle class that was being set upon by plutocrats of a Mitt Romney-ish variety. Now, it helped that Republicans aided this effort by nominating Mitt Romney, the worst person they could have chosen for that type of framing, essentially. But this was a choice that the Obama campaign welcomed because it gave them the campaign that they wanted. And one really striking example of this is an ad that the Obama 2012 campaign ran in Ohio, which ran through what became a, what was already a standard litany of terrible things that Mitt Romney has done for capitalism to the working man. The tagline of that ad, though, to me, it's really striking. Tagline of this ad, Mitt Romney, not one of us. And it's that focus on economic issues in 2012 that allows Barack Obama, famously the first black president of the United States, uh, son of a Kenyan and a woman from Kansas, uh, try, sort of the princeling of the American meritocracy. So someone who will become in sort of the conservative imaginary, so alien to the vision of heartland authentic America. Well, it's that focus on economic issues that gives the Obama campaign the plausible narrative, the, the back to say in 2012, you know who's not one of us? Mitt Romney. He's the outsider. He doesn't represent you. He doesn't see you. He doesn't understand you really, really powerful message to that middle and working class constituency. And Obama and Axelrod's explicit on this in his memoir, especially that white middle class and working class constituency that they saw as key to winning in those blue heartland and those blue wall states like Ohio in 2012, and which it was in fact electorally. But if you put yourself in the shoes of one of those voters that have been won over by the Mitt Romney, not one of us campaign of 2012, then the question is, what did the Obama administration actually give you by 2016? And there's a long list of accomplishments from my perspective that we're celebrating. There's victory in the Supreme Court that vindicating gay marriage. There's the Iran nuclear deal. There's action on climate change. You can run down the list and you can run down the list of progressive victories that the Obama administration reaped. And there's also, I think it's not to be neglected that as president in his second term, Obama actually talks a pretty good game on class politics. He says that what we are seeing now in the United States is a spreading of a type of poverty that I encountered first on the South side of Chicago. And when I was starting as a community organizer in the 1980s, is that now it's white people who are white people in rural America are confronting problems that were at previously seen as problems for black people in poor urban America. So what we see is a breakdown of this racial divide. And this is a, he says, an urgent problem for us to take on. The problem is that for a variety of reasons, from Republican control of Congress to the increasing support, increasing importance of suburbanites in the Democratic Party, the Obama administration both doesn't actually make any progress on those economic issues, and by the end doesn't seem terribly urgent about it. And especially is not helped by the fact that in response to the Donald Trump Make America Great a campaign, Make America Great Again campaign of 2016, Obama himself, along with other Democrats, will say, What are you talking about? Make America great. America is already great. And that sort of it turns out that I would argue these sort of Trumpist Republicans had set a trap that the Obama Democrats fell into, and Clinton probably more so than Obama, just because she was a less deaf politician than he is, but that they had fallen into a type of will blindness that failed to recognize the limitations of what the administration delivered for the type of folks who would help, who had contributed in a crucial way to that victory in 2012. Now, I would just add that even though this is a significant point for interpreting the Obama administration, I think, and also for the rise of the Trump, of the rise of the populist Trumpified Republican Party, that this isn't something that this isn't a pattern that's unique to Obama. That if you look at Bill Clinton in the 90s, there's a very, very similar story about an administration that grows defensive about its accomplishments and that ends up in a weaker position with some of that, with that working class, middle class population in by the end of its term than it was at its start. Again, in as with Obama, it wasn't Clinton who reaped the sort of bitter rewards of this, but his chosen successor. So it's Hillary Clinton who bears the brunt of the sort of failures, the shortcomings of the Obama administration, Al Gore who bears the brunt of the shortcomings of the Clinton administration. And casting eyes abroad, this is something that, for instance, Tony Blair and New Labour encountered as well. This is a pattern that we see in a lot of center-left governments where they often win election running on a broadly populist economic platform, 
fail to deliver on key components of it, but do well enough to win re-election and then grow defensive for understandable reasons about both their achievements and their shortcomings. And so then end up playing to the hands of some type of conservative challenger down the line. Okay, can I push back a little bit on that? Yeah, absolutely. Find something where I disagree with that. Excellent. One, I, I think you're you're neglecting two things. One was the radicalization of white progressives, getting around 2010 and 2012. All of the polls show that they moved way to the left on on climate change, on abortion being unlimited, on transgender issues, things like that. Way to the left not only of the general public, but of African-American Democrats and uh, Hispanic Democrats. Uh, And at the same time, I think that the Obama second term was the most radically culturally left-wing administration that the U.S. has had until Biden's, which is even more radical. Uh, So, for example, in his first term, uh, the left wanted Obama to, you know, uh, do an executive order legalizing broad groups of unauthorized immigrants through DREAM Act. And Obama said, I'm not a dictator. I can't do it. Well, he gets reelected. And then he tries by executive order uh, and the courts rein him in. Uh, you know, he, he was very cautious on gay rights, really didn't endorse gay marriage until it was practically won. But, but that was a cause that the Democrats and, and like-minded Republicans had been open about for years, right? And finally changed public opinion. Suddenly in 2015, if I get my dates right, the uh, Obama Justice Department is threatening to sue every K through 12 school system in the country if it does not allow biological males into women's sports and women's locker rooms, include this K through 12, it's not college. And the Justice Department under Obama was threatening to sue and withdraw all money, all federal money. Most federal money, as some of you may know, for K through 12 schools goes to special ed programs. So they were gonna say that unless you allow biological males to shower with uh, biological females, we're gonna cut off your special ed program. And this came like a thunderclap uh, out of the blue. And, and, and so I think if, uh, Tim is right to think about like these Obama voters in the Midwest, right? And then all of a sudden, Obama is pushing, uh, you know, biological males in female uh, showers in in elementary and junior high schools. Uh, He is, uh, uh, by executive order, there was no debate about this. There was no big debate in Congress. There was no law. This was just imposed out of nowhere by decree. Uh, You know, at the same time, uh, and I can guarantee you uh, as a landowner, this was a huge issue in much of the country. Uh, the EPA has this Waters of the United States Act, which terrified uh, landowners uh, around the country uh, in rural areas because uh, they, they were classifying ephemeral rainwater ponds as protected waters because uh, uh, migrating birds you know, could, could uh, stop there. Uh, and this created a huge backlash. It was never reported in the New York Times, the Washington Post. Uh, but so that was the image, you know, in, in the minds of many of these people who I think had voted for Obama, right? That is like, and they were totally unprepared. There was, there was and, and this is something I think you have to deal with, with the realignment. These earlier realignments, everybody knew what the goal of the Civil Rights Act was, okay? This was publicly debated, right? over many years, many decades. The second term Obama agenda was a lot of issues which appealed to this radicalized, mostly white, upper middle class elite uh, based in the NGOs and the universities. But nobody in the rest of the country even knew about this stuff. Like all of a sudden you're a bigot if you don't use pronouns, right? And so much of the United States population, and you can, I'm not taking sides here. I'm just making this sociological observation. This stuff really just came out of nowhere uh, and, and suddenly was there uh, in Obama's second term, and you could be fired for not using a person's pronouns, right? Uh, and then again, I'm, I'm, if this, 
if this was radically different from the civil rights movement and the gay rights movement, which did not begin out of nowhere with executive orders. I mean, it began with marches and building up and, you know, persuasion and so on. So I, I think you have to uh, take that into account, this kind of rule by decree. Yeah. If I could just say something in response, Eric. Like, all right. So, and I think that it's easy to fold pretty much everything that you just said into that narrative. I think it bolsters just the case that there really was a transition in the second term of the Obama administration. And that itself, you can bring bring on this point if you just contrasted Obama's position on all these issues with what he said in Audacity of Hope. I'm thinking about this because at GW uh, this semester, I'm teaching a class on Barack Obama's America, where among other things, we do a pretty close reading of that book. And it is just by itself a uh, telling indication of how much the Democratic Party has changed in the less than 20 years since that's come out. I think the only points where I would disagree, putting aside just the normative questions about you know how we feel about the various policies and their um, comparative worth, I would... Th- well, I wonder about the timing of the radicalization that you're talking about within the sort of democratic progressive activist class. Um, to me, and just my narrative of the Great Awakening hinges more on sort of second term events, and especially the flourishing of Black Lives Matter, another movement whose rise you could fold into this story, so that it really is more of the pressure escalates in the second term in a way that you can see pieces of this in 2010, but that one reason why Obama is able to get away with what would seem like a more sort of centrist positioning than Hillary Clinton could afford in 2016 is partly he's more popular, but also because the pressure wasn't there in the same way. So I think that if in which case it just makes the break in the second term um, even more significant. And then the other question is just out of all the issues that you mentioned, what is the relative salience? So when I look back at the Trump campaign, thinking about what they chose to run on in 2016, undeniably, you know, it's insane that I omitted immigration from my list of sort of important Obama administration shifts in the second term. And again, if you go back to Audacity of Hope, that's a book where Obama will say, listen, I feel a surge of resentment when I have to get my car fixed and the person talks to me in Spanish rather than English. You know, a sentiment that's impossible to imagine Hillary Clinton uttering on the campaign trail in 2016. Like, and so that is just on the rhetorical level, a sign of the policy shifts. But on something like trans rights, I think of Donald Trump at the Republican convention proudly announcing his support for LGBTQ rights and saying how happy he was to hear cheers for that at the at a Republican national convention. So like clearly it will become an issue later, especially in activist circles. But I just wonder if we're looking at that sort of median voter and so that Obama Trump swing voter trying to prioritize like what exactly is most salient for win. My inclination would be a sense of sort of frustration with the limits of the recovery combined with a broad ranging set of cultural concerns, which probably immigration and maybe if you buy like the Michael Tesla argument, a sense of discontent that Obama has like firmly aligned himself with BLM or something against me, that will loom more largely than trans issues, which would come to the fore later. But, and again, this is of course like bracketing just the normative question of how we feel about those policies, but that would just be how I try to fold your contribution into the larger framing while nuancing it a little bit on the edges. Wow, this last exchange uh, makes me really want to extend this to 6 or 6.30 to keep this going, but I can't. So we have to draw this to a close. I want to thank Tim, Michael, Ellie, and Christian for this great conversation. I'm going to turn this back to Christian for final words on this Halloween evening. Christian? Thank you, Eric. My thanks also to Tim, Ellie, and Michael. And just a reminder, next week we have two seminars on Monday, Margaret Burnham's By Hands Now Known, and on Thursday we will discuss Republics of Myth. We hope to see you then. Take care. Stay safe. Good night.